make really large brush strokes. I wasn't really hip on why Picasso was so important until I saw a really good explanation from a teacher about Picasso and why he was so instrumental is he did very nice light brush strokes. Then he came back and did another, so there's layers upon layers and upon layers. And as we have different multicultural students in class, different types of male, African American males, Latino males, we also have African American males, of course, there's also Cuban males, Hispanic males, different types of males. It's all a palette, but there's diversity in each type of palette. So there's different layers upon layers. So I think in making sure that we remember the art form and teaching is something that's a concern. Beautiful. To hear you articulate moving from and using the art form format, to hear you articulate going from an abstract concept to something that is going to be concrete, it puts you in a frame of mind of going from the abstract concept of learning moving it to the concrete of teaching. And I'm reminded that teachers years ago used to say that telling isn't teaching and told isn't taught. So as you move to that more concrete form, I could see that developing nicely with the curriculums that we have in place. Dr. Carter Andrews, how would you like to respond to that question? Well, I, I think there are a couple of several issues that are pressing facing boys of color in schools today. And I, I think the first one would be and not to be, um, you know, kind of cheesy in this way, but, uh, you know, society has criminalized boys of color um, as well as dehumanized them. And so I think this crisis in education, uh, particularly for black and brown males, is really about, um, you know, reinstating them to their full humanity as citizens in our society and also as students in our schools. And so, um, you know, we've got to deal with this issue around criminalization and dehumanization of these young men. And I think as an umbrella, uh, there are several issues undergirding this criminalization and dehumanization. One being our lack of understanding about the socialization uh, the negative socialization that's occurring for boys of color in this society and the lack of healthy role models uh, for them both in their neighborhoods, their environments, but also in school settings. Whether those are uh, men, number one, healthy male role models, healthy male role models of color, and then because our teaching force is primarily uh, one that is female dominated, healthy female role models that are, are helping them construct more positive uh, male identities. Uh, another way in which I think, <clears throat> or another issue that I think is pressing for these males that's connected to um, you know, this, this need to kind of construct positive male identities is really having a sense of a variety of constructions of masculinity. Um, so, particularly for boys of color, I think there's this kind of single narrative in our society about what it means to be masculine. And that narrative, <clears throat> excuse me, in a lot of ways leads them to engage in maladaptive behaviors. Um, and our schools have not done a good job of helping our young boys of color develop adaptive strategies for navigating the school process. So we've got to rethink how we um, help these young men write different narratives about themselves um, that counter these negative constructions of masculinity that we have in society. And then lastly, I think a pressing issue that boys of color are facing um, in society and in the, in the school system is issues of poverty. Right? We know that living in um, poverty conditions don't have to be a barrier, but there are certainly social constraints, resource constraints that um, parallel living in um, economic disadvantage, and that those constraints shape the way in which our black and brown youth experience schooling. And so, you know, if I had to sum up those most pressing issues, for me, it would be about, um, you know, lack of positive role models, um, 
issues around identity development and uh, more healthy constructions of masculinity that are tied to academic success. And then lastly, um, you know, helping our, our males of color kind of navigate and live within their limit situations uh, in their economic conditions, which sometimes are, are often constrained. Wonderful. You know, your articulation of, of, of the response uh, <laughs> paints a very clear picture of the disenfranchisement of boys mm -hmm. of color in a K-12 setting yep. often leads to stratification of education mm -hmm. where they lose privilege, power, and prestige That's as they right. become older and move into society. Yes. Dr. Flanau, same question to you. Well, uh, again, this is a, a wonderful opportunity, and I appreciate being uh, asked to speak on what I think is a really important issue. Um, if I had to kind of identify some of the most pressing issues that are affecting young men of color, um, I think much of what Dr. Carter Andrews and what uh, Dr. Ransaw um, said that would kind of be echoed in, in my own comments. Um, part of what I, I, uh, I think a, a really big issue of, excuse me, has been captured um, in an Office of Civil Rights report that was issued just mm -hmm. a few months ago mm -hmm. that talked about the overrepresentation of, of young folks of color um, in uh, the uh, students that are suspended and expelled from school. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a brief context, uh, about 18% of all preschool students are uh, students of color, actually more specifically African American students. Mm -hmm. uh, yet they make up about 50% of those students that are suspended from school for one or more days. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, when you look at the, the African-American population of students that are being suspended, and we're talking about preschool, about 80% uh, of those students are, are young men, mm -hmm. are young black boys, right? Um, so even though this is a, a kind of a, a K-12 conversation, I think part of understanding the issues and the challenges that face young men of color as they go through K-12 uh, K schools um, happens before they even arrive. Mm -hmm. and, and some of that mm -hmm. has to do with the way that they are depicted as being dangerous and criminalized. I mean, yeah. part of what we have to ask ourselves um, and just be really honest with ourselves about, is asking ourselves this question, do we believe that young black men and young men of color are inherently more uh, dangerous, mm -hmm. are inherently mm -hmm. um, uh, less likely to um, uh, be involved or excited about school? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and part of what we have to do is make a decision there, right? Some of us believe that there is nothing um, special about being African American or being a, a student of color that predisposes one to being violent or predisposes them to being anti-school, right? Part of what we have to recognize is that these students are socialized in a broader context and, and even when they arrive at school that, that positions them in, in ways that makes them more dangerous, right? And, and these young men um, are, are curious. They're excited mm -hmm. about school just like every, everyone, everyone else. else, but something happens in those early years in school where students start, uh, those African American and other young men of color stop being looked at as, as young students and, and they start to be perceived as, as older mm -hmm. men, right? Older yes. folks that are actually threatening, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's some, um, some research that support this, the, the idea that, uh, that uh, young men of color are, are thought of as being older than when compared to their white peers. Right. Um, so, so getting us to a point where we can start to be, have an honest conversation with ourselves about how we're depicting young men of color um, it is, I think, a very important first step and a real pressing issue because we know that how people develop identities is not only impacted by the kind of internal narratives that they mm -hmm. have about yes. themselves, mm -hmm. but the kind of external, external narratives that exist about them, right? Mm -hmm. How people talk about me, how people treat me has an impact on the way that I see myself, right? And so uh, thinking about some of these structural issues and, and thinking about kind of the disproportionate representation of students um, at the preschool level that are being asked to leave school, right? Yes. These have uh, long lasting implications for the K-12 context. Oh. Students um, are being told in explicit ways and um, uh, in subtle ways and not so subtle ways that they don't belong in school, mm -hmm. right? And that uh, that happens in a way that they are kind of more harshly chastised for for behavior that other students are doing, but it also um, manifests in the way that students don't see themselves in the teachers that are in their classroom. They don't see themselves in the curriculum that they mm -hmm. um, are, are, are have, they have to kind of um, go through in, in their schooling. So all of these things, I think, have a huge impact on the way that young men um, not only understand themselves as students in schools, but the way that all of us see uh, these young men as students in schools. So that embedded in that, in that response, I think, in, in kind of summarizing these um, larger pressing issues, we have, 
we have an issue with the way that we are looking at young men of color, right? And, and there are um, structural but, and un, uh, kind of internal uh, consequences for that. But that has a, a lot uh, to do and has large impacts on the way um, that young men are developing identities that function in school and society. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are, I, I think, are some of the kind of big issues that I, I tend to focus on when thinking about mm -hmm. um, young men of color in school. Excellent, excellent. That segues perfectly into the second part of this question. Uh, from your perspective and based on your research, please spend a few minutes telling us what strategies or approaches you would suggest for addressing some of the issues we just discussed. And we'll continue with you, Dr. Flannow. Yeah. So there's a, a number of strategies um, that, that I think are, are important for uh, practitioners and researchers to keep in mind, um, particularly when they're thinking about the, the experience of young men of color in school. Um, and some of them seem really simple. I mean, Lisa Delpit uh, has been uh, an, an amazing um, uh, scholar and educator in this area. And uh, in, in some ways, she, she kind of boils it down for, for a lot of us when she says there's a couple of things that we can do. She says um, one of the first things is, uh, is to believe in that, that all children can learn. Yes. I mean, it seems like a really simple idea. Um, but we, we have to kind of confront these, these larger issues that um, tend to become taboo when we're talking about education in general. But if you really believe that all students are capable of learning, um, that, that becomes probably one of the first barriers that we can overcome to kind of making a, a, a big difference. Um, the other thing is kind of just fight foolishness. She writes about this in her, in her book, uh, Multiplication is for White People, so this is a kind of a plug for her book, but it's a, it's a powerful <laughs> text and I think it helps us mm -hmm. kind of understand what, 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 what we can do, especially when we're thinking about expectations. But this notion of fighting foolish, foolishness, I think boils down to the way that we have disproportionate and different um, expectations of our students. If you look at the types of uh, assignments that are, are being given to students that are attending um, majority uh, schools of color, right? And, and compare that to students um, in more affluent white communities and, and even looking at the same textbooks. Some of the research that Lisa Delpa has, has taught us, uh, has told us is that um, these students are getting different types of assignments. One is, is, you know, fill in the blank and the other is, you know, analyze and discuss, right? And, and so getting to this idea of um, fighting, fighting foolishness, we need to make sure that we're not um, dumbing down our education. We ma maintain this idea of having high expectations for mm -hmm. our students. Um, but she's also very intentional about saying that there ne needs to be supports that are put in place. It's not just about raising expectations and that's it. You have to raise expectations and also provide support for students. Absolutely. Um, and then the last thing that, that Lisa Delpa um, kind of offers is this idea is get to learn who our children are, right? Get to know their lived experiences. Find mm -hmm. meaningful ways to kind of bring that into the classroom. And I think that uh, you know, that that makes a big difference for students. Uh, there's kind of this, uh, I wouldn't say it's a cliche, but there is this saying, right? Students um, don't care how much you know mm -hmm. until they know how much you care, right? Absolutely. And that mm -hmm. is a, a very simple but yet effective strategy for a teacher to kind of um, adopt when they're kind of moving through um, their classrooms and, and developing curriculum. Um, there have been a number of other strategies that are that are developing and have been developed over some time as it relates to the young men of color and some of those uh, are developing single sex learning spaces academies uh, for young men um, and there's emerging research on it that I imagine we'll have an opportunity to talk about a little bit later um, but but there are, are a number of things that we can do some are very simple uh, to make sure that we're being more effective in the way that we engage young men of color wonderful Dr. Carter Andrews, would you like for me to repeat the question? No, I, I have the question. T Terry brought up some really good points there that, you know, yes, I think I'd like to, exp um, you know, uh, parallel in some ways. There are a couple things that I was thinking about, um, especially connected to this notion of just fighting foolishness. And at the heart of, um, you know, reaching uh, young men of color and helping them really achieve their maximum potential is building relationships. Mm -hmm. And we know that there are um, so many seminal scholars and researchers who talk about the importance of relationship building. Um, and I think one way in which we can help educators really learn how to tap into you know, the skillfulness of building relationships with young men of color is through kind of these strategic, sustained professional development opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are ways in which, you know, we're, we're asking t uh, culturally different educators to try to connect with and help uh, these young men 
exceed at high, succeed at high levels, but there are a lot of ways in which they don't know how to do that. And so the one shop, you know, diversity day, half day, or full day professional development sessions aren't going to provide them the long-term skills to do that. And so I think there are ways in which at a policy level within school districts and even school buildings, we have to rethink what are those professional learning opportunities that teachers and even administrators have to really engage in deep study, critical self-reflection about understanding who they are in relationship to these young men that they're teaching, understanding the young men and their needs, and then thinking about how to blend those two to create a learning experience that's really beneficial and rich for um, boys of color. And so having said that, I think about Gloria Ladson Billings' book, The Dream Keepers, right? We often um, look to that book to understand how she talks about culturally relevant teaching. But I was doing some professional development um, with some teachers here in the state and really having them look at an element of, of that culturally relevant teaching that she um, talks about in the book around, she has some tables about how do we seek improvement, what does that look like, improvement strategies, and excellence strategies and teach culturally relevant teachers that are really seeking excellence out of their students are more of these coaches these mentors they take on behaviors and skills that are really about coaching and mentoring which in a lot of ways is about a deeper investment in that young person and really teaching to their whole self right um, th there's another um, and I think there are ways in which, you know, for some teachers, they're starting at the seeking improvement level. We can't expect them to be at seeking excellence. But that along your educational um, trajectory, your professional trajectory, you should say, I'm invested in seeking excellence, right, for these young men of color. And that I'm committed to um, building those skills within myself and seeking out opportunities, right, through my professional learning where I can do that. But I think that's a systemic issue where building leaders have to be committed to this kind of culturally relevant and responsive leadership that then allows teachers to say, I understand that I've got to grow in some areas in order to help these young men that really get at building um, relationships. There, there are a lot of reports, the Shelt Foundation, you know, um, regularly reports about the significance of relationship building, particularly with men of, uh, boys of color, that can reduce the number of discipline referrals because now you understand how to implement restorative discipline Absolutely. practices. Hence, you reduce the number of suspensions and referrals. Um, so I think one strategy, and I can talk about others uh, as we go along, is rethinking how we provide how we provide professional development for teachers and the kinds of professional development that we invest in that's long term and not just one shot deals. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Ransaw, let me preface the same question yes, with sir. the fact that we live in the richest, most powerful country on the planet. And this continuum of miseducating boys of color has been a stain on the fabric of education, not only in the state of Michigan, but in the entire country. So with that prelude, the same question to you, what are some strategies that we can implement to turn this thing around? And whose job is it? Is it just the responsibility of people of color mm. to deal with the problem of boys of color? Wow. Well, right off, right off, we were, um, as, as, my, as my colleagues were uh, pressing on today, I think that brush strokes, I think, is important in this scenario. And so if we look at how males of color in the classroom from preschool are being slightly pushed out 
right? That's part of the color palette of being portrayed, being negatively, that's kind of, it's part of how they're painted, so to speak. So it's, I think <coughs> pressing on, looking at the different layers is important. And one of the ways that we can work on that is that if you're an artist, and let's keep this in mind if you're a teacher as an artist, if you want to reach an audience, how you frame your picture, you have to know your students a little bit, or in this case, you have to know your audience in order to reach them, right, to, make your, to sell your paintings, to get your point across. And so a lot of that has to do with this new term called expectation violation, which I do afraid, not a new term, EVT, expectation violation theory. That has, I feel the communication's been around for a while, and so what happens in the classroom is that there are expectation violations. I see in the classroom is that there are some expectations that teachers have about how classroom behavior, what it should look like, what it shouldn't look like. And I think there's expectations that males of color have in the classroom that I don't really think are being addressed. So to push just a little bit more on that, if we look at the expectation violation, that's where I see part of the discord, mm -hmm. right, is that there's different types of expectations. And when those expectations are met, that's when, oh, well, there's a little bit of difficulty. They're not, be and, and to be very clear, expectation, it, really good way of expectation, it's not necessarily where communication is the problem. So there's an assumption that there's a problem in a relationship, you need to talk about it more or more communication. That's a problem, right? But the real problem isn't the communication, the real problem is the other person isn't doing what you expected them to do mm. with what you communicated, which is not the same thing as, as communication. You follow what I'm saying? So expectation violation, I think, is a big role. And looking at expectation violation is really important. So if you look at where you were talking about being one of the richest countries in the world, America is not the only country on the planet that is having problems with males of color. If we look at UK, there's some things going on in the UK. And one of the things that they've done that's been a practical and positive solution is they did this. And get this, you ready for it? They made teachers a priority making teaching and teachers a priority, right? So that's really important. So there's not a lot of literature that says that if you are not a person of color, that you can't teach a person of color. I've had some white professors basically treat me like they were my parents and yelling at me when I was misbehaving like I was their son. And I didn't take it right at the time, but I learned a little bit later, right? So, so I've had some really influence. I, I wouldn't be here without, because quite frankly, there's not enough teachers of color, and if I, went by the thought that only people of color could teach people of color, I wouldn't have got here. So making teachers a priority, all teachers a priority, that's what's been very tough in the UK. Also, another term called emotional literacy by Richard Majors in the UK. Emotional literacy has to do with teachers looking at where they are internally, how they feel and where they are and how that relates to their student. So it's the student's emotional literacy, right, and what you call emotional intelligence, very similar. So the student's looking at where they're at, where you're, where the teachers are at. Another thing that's been very, done very well and popular is here in Michigan, the African American, African American Young Men of Promise Initiative have a couple of things that are done really well. They split their categories up of what they're doing. The African American Young Men of Promise Initiative by Michigan Department of Education, they did a pilot program and they're redoing this program and instituting it in different places across the state. And two things have been really important. One is academic vocabulary. So if I talked about art earlier, what is it, what's a person art? Well, one important thing about art is how a person expresses themselves. So your language is important. If you discount a student because they come into the classroom because they don't speak the way you speak, that's a problem, right? You, to teach and educate a child, you must know what they think and how they think and how they speak to teach them, right? So those are really important things, unless a student can articulate in his own words what you're teaching them, they really haven't gotten it, right? So that's so the academic vocabulary is a way to connect where that student mm -hmm. is at. So being able to take what you want them to do and what them to learn in their terms. So pushing on academic vocabulary and giving them academic vocabulary, but at the same time understanding how the students talk so you can reach them so it works both ways. Another thing which is really amazing, <laughs> positive phone calls home. Now, I don't know about you, the only reason why I got here, other than people helping me out, I had some people praying for me, right? But in addition to prayer, my mother visited the school like about three or four times a week. So they, every, all the teachers knew my mom by first name because I was always in the office. 
So the positive phone call home, if they would have had a positive phone call to, to my mother, that may have made my life a little bit easier. But just your first initial contact as a teacher to a parent, hey, I just called, Johnny had a great day in school today. Um, any questions, give me a call, click. Oh my God, Johnny, what did you do in school? Now it opens up a dialogue and having a conversation with the teacher about your son's academics becomes a safe place and not a place of contention. Before we segue into uh, some of our live stream questions, I just want to kind of put this out here for the audience because we are having an open and honest conversation about educating boys of color. And I wanted to, to comment on the response that Dr. Flanau gave because as he was responding, I was, I was conceptualizing that the miseducation of boys of color in such disproportionate rates tends to lean towards not only a civil rights violation of how our children are not being educated as a subgroup, but it borders on a human rights violation of how our children are not being educated as a subgroup. And I just want to kind of put that out there for the audience to begin to, to kind of think about uh, both our live stream audience as well as our audience that's present here at the Kellogg Center. But, uh, and chances are that it'll be a future conversation that we'll have a chance to <laughs> hold a symposium on. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to some of the hack hashtag uh, live stream questions. And let's see what's out there. Uh, let's see. Here's a question from Twitter. What do teacher educators, what do teacher educators need to do differently to better prepare teachers of black boys? Jump in, whoever wants to go first. Mm -hmm. Well, I think first they have to ask themselves, do I understand uh, black boys, right? Um, I'm probably going to be going out on a limb here, but I think we have a lot of teacher, uh, teacher educators educating future teachers who themselves don't understand the cultural nuances about um, the lived experiences of African American males and um, other males of color and um, some of the challenges they're facing in school. So there's this kind of um, knowledge gap between the teacher educator, the future teacher who then goes out to teach with a lack of understanding about these cultural nuances that they're going to face in the classroom. So in the same way that we're charging uh, K-12 learning environments to, you know, continue educating their teachers, in higher ed we have to engage in continual professional development for ourselves so that we have this kind of critical consciousness um, and are skilled in ways that are really useful for future teachers who are going to teach these males. Um, you know, as someone who considers herself, you know, fairly skilled and conscious and knowledgeable, I see myself as a lifelong learner in these issues. Um, but I have colleagues both within my college and around the country who have a lower level of consciousness, knowledge base. Some of them recognize that. Many others don't. Right. And so uh, in the same way that Gary Howard talks about white teachers can't teach what they don't know, teacher educators can't teach what they don't know. And so I think we have to raise the question in colleges of education, how do we re-educate for some teacher educators and continue educating for others so that we are best equipped to prepare teachers to teach boys of color. Beautiful. It is without question there must be a paradigm shift uh, at the teacher college level mm -hmm. in order for us to drill down into performance in the classroom that's going to change this, this continuum. Yeah. Dr. Flanau, looked like you were ready to weigh in halfway yeah. through Dr. Oh, Andrews. Yeah, thank you. I comment. was going to kind of piggyback off of uh, Dr. Tyler Andrews uh, comment. I mean, we are all impacted, every single yep. one of us, we are all impacted by the dominant narrative that exists around young men of color, right? Uh, those of us who uh, think that we are, um, do, you know, critical educators mm -hmm. and, you know, are uh, folks who are social justice oriented, uh, the only difference is that we 
you, I think those folks and those of I like to consider myself one of those folks have to continually play a, another narrative in our mind that counters the, the dominant narrative mm -hmm. that that, that pervades our, our society and is always mm -hmm. happening about how dangerous young men of color are or how uh, uh, you know, not interested they are in school. There has to be a really active voice. Um, and so I think for teacher educators, part of what we have to do when we're, we're working with uh, future teacher candidates is to get, when we get students in our classroom that say they want to be teachers and teachers of all students, we have to begin to disrupt those dominant narratives. Yes. We have to disrupt those mm -hmm. ideas that are so endemic in our, in our society that say, you know, all you have to do is work hard and everything will work out all right. That's not a, a, a reality that's for right. everyone. And mm -hmm. that's not something, um, that, uh, something that's going to be as effective as an approach when you're talking to students who are uh, currently historically marginalized, right, mm -hmm. systemically, uh, institutionally marginalized. And so there, there has to be an active um, and very intentional effort by teacher educators to disrupt dominant narratives that exist um, that, that impact all of us yeah. uh, about how we think about people who have been marginalized and specifically in the context of this conversation, young men of color. And let me just add to that yes. that it's not just good food for teachers who are going into urban contexts, right? Even the teacher who is going to a 99% you know, white student population context needs to understand how to teach young men of color because he or she needs to be able to disrupt that narrative for the 99% white student population that they're interacting with every day. Because those students then either perpetuate the narrative in their own lives, in their own communities, or because they have a teacher who is uh, more critically conscious around these social justice, human rights issues, they then are able to go out into society and deconstruct and fight these perpetuated dominant narratives. So this, this food, if you will, is good for all students, whether the students in front of you are black and brown or they are not. Absolutely. Dr. Ransaw, Sorry. that reminds me of, a, of a, a saying that my grandmother used to share with us as we were growing up. She would say, so bendeth the twig, so groweth the tree. And that applies to not only teachers of college educators, but it also applies to what we do with children in the classroom. So I use that to have you segue into the same question from the hashtag um, statement that we had. What types of things do you see us being able to do differently to better prepare teachers for, of boys of color? If we keep doing the same thing that we've been doing, we're going to keep getting the same thing that we've got. How would you respond to that? Well, I think. I, I get stuck. Well, my, my grandmother, you talked about between, <laughs> my grandma always told me to go get a switch. That's what she told me. So that's how I, I went through. So I think to do something differently, I think that it's really crucial to make your students relevant and to push on your males of color relevant in the classroom. And especially since they're in a specific subcategory not of their own accord, making black males relevant in the classroom. And what does it mean to, be, to make someone relevant? Well, if you are a black male, let's, let's think about this. If you're a student, you come to the class, and if you're a black male, you're told not to dress the way that you want to dress. You're told not to talk the way you want to dress. You're told not to write what you want to write about. You're told not to read things that you find interesting. Where is the relevancy? If you are in a place that is not respectful, much less understanding of who you are as a person or individual, well then how can you thrive in that environment? And so to make black males or males of color or in the larger content, your students relevant in a classroom, you have to be able to take the material and say, hey, this is this, this is that. This is why this is important. This is why you need to know. And so a really crucial part to that is code switching, right? So what we're really asking a lot of students of color who are not of the majority uh, or the model minority, so to speak, is you're asking them to code switch, right? And so to be able to code switch, which is really important, the teachers have to be able to code switch as well. And to be able to code switch is really important. So if we think about 
making students relevant in the classroom. How this works is you have to code switch, you have to be fluent in your own culture, and you have to be fluent in at least one other culture. So we're asking our students to be fluent in our language as academics and education, to be fluent in our language, but are we fluent in their language? And to be fluent in their language, you have to understand the way they speak, the way they talk, and the way they think. And once you do that, that starts to build bridges and connections. The number one indicator for success for minority students in college is having a close relationship with a faculty member. Right? And so that translates to the same thing in the classroom, having close relationships with their students. And to push on this a little bit more, I sat back and thought about this, had a lot of conversation, and you look at everyone knows who their best teacher was. Right? Oh, I like Mr. So and so, I like Mrs. So. -and -so. What I learned from them, they made math important, they made this. But if you really think about it, what made your teacher the most popular teacher or your favorite teacher wasn't necessarily what they taught you, it's how they made you feel. All right? And so I'm thinking that's crucial and important. Wonderful. We're going to take one more uh, question from uh, our K 12 outreach. What do you see as the dilemmas, tensions, in using labels such as boys of color to frame the educational challenges that black and brown males are facing in today's public schools? How is such a label helpful? How might it be harmful? How might educators use the labels in deficit ways instead of empowering ways? I don't think there's anything inherent about the label of boys of color that, um, that kind of gets us to think uh, kind of get us deficit oriented. I, I think um, part of the bigger issue is that there are, uh, there's a, uh, a strong deficit orientation that a lot of folks have when talking about boys of color, folks of color, uh, whatever the case may be. So right. I, I don't know that, um, that there's something wrong with the label, but I, I do think that this uh, provides an opportunity for us to talk about this notion of color blindness, mm -hmm. right? And this idea that, um, you know, uh, one of the things that I often hear uh, working with, with teachers um, is this, this idea that if I can just not look at my students' race and just see all of my students mm -hmm. as students, then, you know, then I won't have to worry about these labeling and, and having kind of deficit orientations about my students. And uh, what we have to recognize when we, uh, you know, look at this idea of colorblindness is that that, that um, is really problematic. And if anything, that further marginalizes students because what it tells students is that there's nothing unique about their experiences um, that warrants any kind of uh, attention or um, uh, kind of a, a special orientation um, for them to kind of be themselves, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that that becomes a, a big problem. Some of the work that I've done around single-sex learning spaces says that, uh, especially when you're talking about young men of color, one of the effective things that has been done in these uh, like black male academies, single-sex classrooms, is that they become counter spaces. They're spaces where young men can come in and they can, they can debrief <clears throat> the experiences that they have that is unique to their identities as young men of color in the context of school and society, right? Not everyone is going to be looked at in the same way. Not everyone is going to get followed around in the store in the same way. Not everyone's going to get um, stopped and frisked uh, in the same way by walking down the street. And those are, those are experiences that students need to unpack. And so coming into a context where a teacher says, I don't see you know, your race, I don't want to label you in, in, in a certain way, uh, just really in, in, in many ways um, de it, it um, undervalues, it devalues uh, the lived experience of students and that's not something as, that I see as being particularly effective uh, in, in being a, an effective educator. It, I would just say the other piece of that is that uh, you know the the side when we talk about race race matters when we don't talk about race race, race still matters, matters. Yes. Micah Pollock talks about this in her book color mute right so it's 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 not that we're just color blind we're also color mute we don't even want to speak about it and uh, the, the labeling in and of itself is not the problem. It's the values we associate with labels. Like some labels actually have positive attributes mm -hmm. in schooling. Um, but the, for, for whatever reasons, right, we've constructed boys of color or black males as problematic when in fact it's the valuing, the way in which we uh, respond to the human beings in the labeled group 
that's problematic. Um, so it's, I think it's always a tension, a dilemma around labeling, but it's, it's by our human nature that we label. Mm -hmm. And so we have to ask ourselves, uh, what is the value we've associated with the label and then how do our thoughts and behaviors <laughs> then translate into helpful or harmful acts for children in the labels. Wonderful. Dr. Ransaw, we're going to give you an opportunity to respond to that question before we go to some questions from our live audience here at the Kellogg Center. Well, I wanted to wrap that up and kind of summarize. I think that goes back to what I was thinking about earlier about <coughs> making large brush strokes. And the smaller brush, brush strokes have more importance because you can layer things over a period of time. And so if we look at the color purple or the color lavender, right? If I didn't see color, I wouldn't see these different shades of purple that we have. And how that works in the classroom for students of color, if I went to the classroom and said, hey, I don't see color, if I came in the classroom more importantly and I said, hey, I don't see white people, I wouldn't see any of my teachers. And if I couldn't see my teachers, how could I learn from them? So if you couldn't see your students and the individual uniqueness and layers, how can you see, if you can't see your students, how can you teach them? Absolutely. Are we able to take a few more from the uh, Twitter the, handle since actually, we started late? Do we have a c time for a couple more? This is an important question. I mean, some of the work that I've done around um, single-sex learning spaces, these, these single-sex learning spaces look different across the country. Mm. And um, uh, some of them are after-school programs. Some of them are in-class. Uh, uh, you know, some of them are a set of classes that students are taking. And, and a big question that folks are asking is, is whether or not the skills, the opportunities, the experiences students have in those, in those contexts translate into other classrooms. And to be honest, there isn't a, a large consensus in the field about whether or not these things um, translate into other classrooms. But what we can say is that students overwhelmingly, especially when it's done right, because that, that's a whole nother conversation, just because you put a, a bunch of black males together in a classroom, you know, and maybe you get a black male teacher in front of them, you know, magic doesn't happen and everything, you know, starts to work out better. But if, if those spaces are done uh, right, then there's an opportunity for students to have I think honest conversations about where they stand with school and for opportunities for them to be uh, more invested in schools in ways that schools haven't been for students of color mm -hmm. and young men of color for a long time. So um, that's just a brief response. I do want to make sure we try to get to some of these, these other, other questions. Can I push on that? One of the things that's very important about after school programs, something that's been very helpful, two things <clears> I can think of off the top of my head. The first thing is having access to internet. One of the problems that students may be having is that they may or may not have internet access at home. So being able to be allowed to have a place where they can either work in a home <coughs> or submit it in a safe, a safe space so that it gets to their teacher's instructor or having access to communication over the internet is really important for after school programs. The second thing that's been very helpful for after school programs, especially with regards to the Girls and Boys Club, is mentorship. Mm -hmm, and why I want to push on mentorship, I think mentorship is really important and crucial but the most effective mentorship programs are not just a bunch of males, as you said, or just a bunch of people in the room getting together and sitting down talking, which is extremely important for efficacy and identity and development, but having measurable outcomes. So how often you meet with that student, what you help your student with, what you talk about, and evaluating that over a period of time strengthens the program, and it does two things. One of the reasons why mentorship programs fail is that the mentee may not always understand their responsibility. So by having assessments over a short and long period of time, it helps the mentee understand what the mentee's responsibility is, right? but also helps the men mentor have some development and some thoughts before they come. So mentorship programs, but not just a mentorship program, mentorship programs with assessments. There's not to be large assessments, but something that you can measure over a period of time so that you can go back and evaluate with the mentees and the mentors to improve the system over a period of time. Any other questions from Twitter or K-12 Outreach? While he's refreshing that, I would say ways in which Boys and Girls Clubs and other organizations like them 
um, <clears throat> can really develop those strong mentoring programs. Partner with, um, you know, in your city, in your community, there are Greek letter organizations um, for African Americans and Latinos um, in which you can, you know, try to achieve same race, same gender mentoring for these males of color. Also, the higher education institutions that are in your area, whether they are community colleges, four-year universities, what are the ways in which places like Boys and Girls Club can be strategic with other community organizations, um, institutions of higher learning to say, you know what, um, we need some structured one-to-one -one mentoring for young men of color um, with men who look like them. Those men are in the community, but it takes outreach uh, for, for organizations like Boys and Girls Club to really tap into those resources. Absolutely. Just, really quick, so the, that question for uh, Boys and Girls Club, uh, a big thing is if you can get students in those out of school spaces to get to think of themselves as knowledge creators, right. it, that has impacts on how they for see the, themselves in school. In so school. the degree to which you're getting them involved in you know, uh, research or, you know, uh, projects where they're collecting data mm -hmm. and giving them opportunities mm -hmm. to share it with people. They start to feel like they're participating in a knowledge creation process and yes. that has, I think, impacts for school. Dr. Flannell, I have a Twitter question for you and then I have a follow-up for uh, Dr. Carter Andrews. To uh, Dr. Flannell, the Twitter question is, can you expand on the quote-unquote foolishness in our classrooms? What is motivating it? And is it necessary to understand it? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, so part of what we, I think, have to recognize is that there has been a long-lasting um, uh, 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 history and uh, um, a practice in schools to look at certain populations and, and treat them differently than others. I mean, we, we don't talk about that often. Mm -hmm. um, we, we kind of always talk about school as being this great equalizer. Every, we often make assumptions that students are getting the same assignments, the same curriculum, right? But when you really start to drill down, when you start to look, like, uh, look at what's happening in the classroom, you see that certain types of activities are happening um, in classrooms with black and brown students that aren't happening um, in, in other classrooms. So mm -hmm. a, a, a pivotal piece, and this is something that was done almost three decades ago, but Jean Anion did this piece on the hidden curriculum mm -hmm. of schools. Mm -hmm. And she looked at what was going on in um, uh, low-income classrooms. Mm -hmm. And she looked at the type of instruction that was taking place. And she basically in these working class schools is what she called them, she found out that those students, the goal, the major goal of instruction was for them to follow instruction. It yeah. wasn't even about, uh, you know, um, getting to the right answer or coming up with creativity or debating mm -hmm. answers. It was about following instructions. And so she, she looked at this and, and this became a big, uh, um, big thing that happened in a lot of the working class schools. Again, this is what I would say you're gonna find in um, schools where you have large uh, numbers of students of color and low income students. But when uh, Jean Annie went to the uh, executive elite schools, right? These students, it wasn't even about following instructions. It was about being creative, debating ideas, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And those are the not, those, we're not seeing those types of practices as prevalently um, in those low income and, and uh, schools of color. And so, so when I talk about foolishness, I'm talking about you know, this idea of what is it that we're expecting our students to do? What is the major mm -hmm. goal of our instruction, right? If our idea of an education for some students is follow instruction and for other students it's create knowledge that's pretty foolish absolutely and yeah. and I, you know i would i would say that that is um is one way that we can start to think about this notion of combating foolishness are are the assignments that you ask really pushing students to think are they allowing students to be creative can they debate answers are you creating those opportunities and this mm -hmm. all gets back to some uh, components of, uh, of of critical pedagogy and and and, um, and Paulo Freire has a lot to say about this, but right. we don't have enough time to talk about it. But, about Paulo <laughs> but well said, thank mm, you so much, Dr. Carter. Your question: What specific types of professional development effectively address relationship building for teachers and students? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I mean, I think you have to have a PD that really focuses on um, what <clears throat> multicultural ed scholars. Um, like James Banks and Christine Sleater call critical multicultural education. So, you know, we can't just stop at the uh, level of let's celebrate our differences, right? That, it's nice to um, 
affirm that we're all unique, we're all different, but how do we take that to the next level and really have educators uh, think about how um, inequality and inequity results from difference. And again, it's not because we're different. It's the values we associate with people's differences. And so we need the kinds of professional development that really allow teachers and administrators to first do that identity work within themselves. How does my own race, gender, social class, background shape the way I even think about teaching and learning? And who's a learner, right? Absolutely. And who has capacity to learn? We say we believe all kids can learn, but your lived experience, um, that what you bring in your cultural backpack mm -hmm. shapes what you really believe about who can learn what types of material. And so we need professional development that allows teachers and administrators to be introspective first and then to think about their positionality within a classroom context. You know, whether that's a upper income context or middle income context, working class or lower income. And so without that layer of introspection, we're missing, I'm back to that knowledge gap yes. piece. Yes. Um, t teachers have a low level ability to then understand the issues and, and, and identities of their students and then work and relate to those. So we have to get to a place where PD becomes about who am I, who am I in relationship to the context that I'm teaching in and in relationship to those students. But it's this critical multicultural professional development and it's very race conscious, yes, it is. right? You are talking explicitly about issues of racism, classism, and sexism, and how those intersect to create inequitable learning opportunities. Absolutely. Uh, at this point, um, we're going to uh, wrap up and take questions from the audience. Um, but before we do that, I just simply want to say that this has been an important and productive conversation today. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for taking part and contributing so much as we explore the issues around educating boys and young men of color. I'd also like to thank the Office of K-12 Outreach and the Michigan uh, State University College of Education, the MyXL Partners, the Michigan Department of Education, MESA, all of our other partners that have made this possible. This ends our formal program, but to those of you in the audience here at the Kellogg Center, we thought we'd give you a chance to stand and ask questions uh, in person. We will continue our live stream of this session so our online participants uh, can benefit from what I anticipate will be a hot discussion. As you take questions, you're gonna hear. I beg your pardon. <laughs> As I take questions. I'm having a technological moment. Yeah. Yes, please. So I'm very interested in the cultural responsive pedagogy stuff, right? And one of the things that always gets talked about first is the need for belief change, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. in 30 years of research, the findings are either null or mixed or very minimal. Uh, and especially if we look at what happens in the field, then we know it's definitely not taking as people go into the, mm -hmm. into the school. So we, we believe that belief change is the driving factor, yet 30 years we haven't been able to get belief change. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking you guys about is one, uh, does it have something to do with the model that we use that says belief drives action as opposed to actions can influence beliefs? And two, mm. are there other ideas that we have around maybe, if this is the thing that we're deciding mm -hmm. we have to do belief change, what are some innovative, different, creative ways that we might do this other than the diversity class mm -hmm. that usually gets the one off mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. has no effect? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I need to repeat that That's question? That's what he was saying, yeah. <laughs> the short version. The, sh the, sh the short version. Uh, belief systems. To the panel, how would you respond to the belief systems that this gentleman just talked about? I think it's an important question, right? Mm -hmm, this this question is. of whether or not um, we need to rethink this idea of, whether, of uh, putting uh, beliefs and trying to deal with people's beliefs before actions. Um, 
as someone that, that, that does some work around identity, mm -hmm. one of the things that we know um, is that uh, identity is constantly negotiated and renegotiated, right? And that um, as a result of doing and, and being in, involved in actions, right, it informs an identity and a, and a belief system, right? And so it, it constantly goes back and forth. So I'm not entirely sure that it's, it's as useful to, to say, well, let's, let's an inverse it and say, let's have the actions and that will, that will uh, inform the beliefs because what that may look like, um, and one of the th challenges that we deal with, um, in, these, in the context of these diversity classes that you're talking about, sometimes there is a, a service learning component, an immersion uh, component, right? And if there isn't an opportunity for people to deconstruct what it is that they're doing and mm -hmm. seeing, that mm -hmm. they have really problematic beliefs that either come out of that or in the context of working with uh, young folks of color, they get reinforced, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. what we have to do are find models that allow us to um, to engage in this constant back and forth, this negotiation right. and renegotiation of understanding mm -hmm. as a result of um, uh, sustained and meaningful interactions, yeah. right? And so I think that that gets connected to the, the second part of your question was, was you know, um, what are some things that might be able, you know, we can do in these, in these uh, uh, diversity classes, these multicultural education classes, right? And, and it's for us, and, I, and it's a challenge, but it's for us to really think through those um, immersion experiences those service learning experiences, and to do them in ways that, um, that allow folks to really identify those tensions, to kind of work up beliefs, and to, and to with those uh, renegotiated beliefs, go back and do action and allow them for, for, for more reflection. Um, uh, Chris Gutierrez uh, did a talk a number of years ago, and she talked about these, um, these uh, I forgot what the phrase was, but it was kind of a eth ethnography, it was a kind of a, um, I don't um, remember. Yeah, it was. It was. I, I forget the particular names of it, but it was. It was this belief that if you can get students to uh, journal and talk about what it is that they're seeing, but having them be in a very guided way, really reflective about what it is that they're seeing, having a, a big conversation about it, unpacking it in the while they're in the middle of those um, experiences, you're much more likely to have uh, belief change in that context. Um, and meaningful belief change uh, in that context. But one of the things, and I'll end here, is that uh, you know, we, we, we talk about belief change as a result of being involved in those classrooms or having those experiences, but I, I firmly believe that, uh, that there has to be more going on because there is a constant um, communication of particular beliefs <coughs> that we have to develop <coughs> counter Excuse beliefs me. and counter you know, narratives too. And, and, and we can do that in the context of a, of a classroom. But let's not act like when our students leave our class or when they go into the community that they're not immediately bombarded with all of these negative right. messages again and again and again that have an impact on their belief system. So let me just say something quickly about that on the in-service side, right? I think a lot of teachers want to do the right thing by boys of color. I do, right? They don't know how to do the right thing. So when you talk about belief change, um, there are a lot of teachers out there who uh, believe boys of color, you know, can achieve at high levels. Uh, that they, they believe um, they they really have this critical care for them, uh, but they don't know how what that looks like in a classroom, instructionally, um, through an assessment, etc. I think picking up on some of what Dr. Flanagan said on the in-service side. Teachers need to have spaces where they can continually reflect. And I believe that needs to be in the during the school day. Like how radical would it be, mm -hmm. right, if we reframed, remodeled the school day where teachers actually had not just a planning period, but like a professional learning community period within the day where they're able to engage in these dialogues um, and bring data in, right? Uh, this kind of culturally, these culturally situated data dialogues where your um, thoughts about cultural difference, some of your stereotypes, biases, assumptions can be deconstructed in the context of the data that you're seeing in your classroom so that even those with the right intentions can actually implement in the right way. We know good intentions are not enough. Um, so this idea of, and we don't have good models of this, right? But I think in some of the work I'm doing with what I'm calling critical race praxis, 
professional development, I'm trying to get at this piece where teachers and administrators are engaged in year-long conversations that are situated with data and then, whoa, how wonderful would it be if then there's this, you know, observation protocol where your principal or, and or some outside person comes in regularly to then observe and debrief with you about how well you're moving along the trajectory of becoming more culturally responsive. In the research, we don't have good models. We don't have good research about belief change, change in dispositions. Uh, but all that to say, I think we can get there, uh, but there have to be some systemic and policy changes about how we utilize time for teachers. You know, Pedro Nogueira talks about the will to do something different. And if we're really concerned about um, educating boys of color in the ways that they should be educated, uh, do, do, how does the will play out in, in, in policy change that really allows teachers and administrators to do something different? Do, to answer sorry, that really, do, let me just give one you, really Chad. quick thing. If you're interested in that self-development for, for the teachers and that belief Change. If you look at Richard Majors and that emotional intelligence, I can't remember the name of the website, but his emotional intelligence addresses everything that they've talked about, and there's a little bit of research on there. It's a great website if you're interested in doing that. Wonderful, Ted. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. My thank name you. is Lindsay. I was just, I'll give you the context of my question. I'm a native of Detroit. I taught high school there. Mm. Worked with at-risk youth, and now as an education consultant, I do some uh, life skill coaching, and I'm in an affluent district, one client. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how can we really follow through on the substantive things you guys are sharing? They're very substantive. If we don't have a broader discussion about race in America, and I tweeted that, and it was retweeted, so it's a conversation mm -hmm. people want to have. How can we really implement what you're suggesting? And, and, and I liken that to bringing the kids in out the cold and feeding them and leaving the parents on the porch. And when you're done, say, now go home with your family mm -hmm. and let's make all this work together. And that's the visual I get from that. So that, that's my question. If we don't discuss race, how can we have an impact? Wonderful. If we don't discuss race, how can we have an impact? How can we make impactful change? Well, Panelists, Ted, we're going to start with you this time. Well, to be very honest, I don't think we can have a substantive conversation without talking about race, just like you said. So I think you pretty much answered that question. But I think you have some broader things that you're trying to get to. So I completely agree. We, what I think we need to work on and focus is, is creating that safe place and having places where people can come and have a discussion about race. So and I think that that's kind of where we need to get push, to push on. When I think about this term, when we think about colorblind or post-racial, I spent a lot of time doing this. And I was doing a little bit of research and came around some things. Well, pretty much everyone is kind of like, especially what, after, what happened after Ferguson, well, there is a little bit of race stuff going on. Okay? Whatever what side of the issue you're on, race is something that's going on and crucial. United States, right, that's a big place. But if we think about the idea when people say that it's a post-racial or that they don't see color, there are a lot of people that actually really believe that they don't see color. And there's a lot of people who actually go through life without contact with anyone outside of their group. So if you live in a world where you don't have to go through a minority neighborhood and you don't have to see on the, on the way to work or home or wherever you're going, if you don't have to see minorities or, or people who, who don't look like you on television and you don't see people who don't look like you in, in your church or where, you, where you have it and your friends and the network group, because there's a recent study that came out that there's a lot of white people that actually don't have any black friends. Right? Mm. And I was like, well, I never thought about it, right? So there's people who actually don't have any of that identity, and then they see a black president, and they go, well, how can there be racism if there's a black president, right? Well, they actually believe that. And I think the reason why having a conversation, I don't think that we've gotten to the place where people are not angry, and they can say, hey, here's some things that we need to talk about. Here's some rules and some parameters and what can we do to talk about race on both sides, right, on both sides of the fence, and to answer your question just a little bit further, how can we have positive change with working with males of color without talking about race? Well, 
I think this is a really good way to start, and I hope we can continue conversations like this. Dr. Carter, Dr. Flannel, would you like to weigh in on that question? Well, I mean, I would say race is talked about all the time in the U.S. I think we just have, Ferguson is one, the, you know, uh, the way in which Obama is attacked. Um, their race is being talked about. I think we have to ask ourselves, are we talking about race and racism, right, in ways that lead to systemic change and um, productive reform, not just in education, but in health care, in government, in uh, the, the prison system, in all of our institutions where we know people of color are systematically disenfranchised and marginalized, um, what, what are the ways in which as a nation we are talking about race and racism that lead to systemic change and reform? And I think a part of that has to be a discussion around white privilege and white supremacy. And so we can talk about race all we want to, but most white folks don't see themselves as raced people. So if we're not going to talk about uh, whites as, as people who are of a racial group and who benefit from a system that privileges them based on their skin color, right, and has historically and continues to systematically disenfranchise people of color, then we're not going to move to the kinds of change we need, not just in education, but in housing, the prison system, the government, health care, et cetera. And so, um, you know, I would be all about talking about race and racism if we're going to also talk about white privilege and white supremacy. Thank you. Dr. Flannel? I would just say this is uh, why I'm glad I, I'm in education. Uh, because I, I think, I, you know, I, I have the privilege of, of teaching a class every semester yep. about race, about racism, about white privilege and white supremacy mm -hmm. with students who, for the most part, have not had meaningful opportunities to engage in that type of discussion. Yep. And I can say that it's a difficult conversation to have every semester, mm. right? Um, yep. But I have to, I have to be hopeful. Um, that those conversations are just um, the beginning of a sustained conversation that, uh, that goes on. And, and these are folks that want to be teachers, right? Um, yeah. So I, I see education, I see schools as um, the best place to have these conversations if we want to have a kind of systemic impact, a, a, social, a social impact. Because uh, there are a few spaces where we can create the type of intimacy, the trust, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the, and, and allow for some courageousness to have those conversations that aren't necessarily, ne necessarily situated in schools, right? So I, I don't know if that, what that looks like in other contexts. I know that we have had um, efforts on, on the media, you know, in the media, mm -hmm. television shows and, and segments on, on certain news networks, right? And those have been um, informative, but I don't know that they have the type of promise and impact um, that education in schools can have. Let me just say, so we talk about school as the great equalizer. So how uh, radical and equalizing would it be to have courses in the high school, in the middle school, where students are able to have dialogues about racism, sexism, classism, et cetera. Um, d as Terry said, I, we teach 17 and 18 year olds who have never even heard the term white privilege. They don't know what gentrification is. I mean, these are things that are relevant and timely for their lived experiences now. So is school really a great equalizer or does it serve to really perpetuate the status quo as is, right? Wonderful. Next question. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, since this has been implemented in various degrees across the country, have there been any studies about the impact on boys of color, children of color, from this policy? There is a bill presently on retention of third graders. Is that correct? Yes. And you want to know if there is any... Research on the impact from other states on children of color. Mm -hmm. Is there any mm -hmm. research on the impact of children of color from other states? And we do know that how the, yeah. the, 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 the industrial prison system uses sure. third grade scores That's and so right. on and so forth. But please, Dr. Flannel. So um, they're not, I'm not immediately aware of um, some of the research that has been done on this. But there are some 
powerful examples. Um, what, there's a, a documentary film done uh, about 10 years ago called Beyond Brown. Mm -hmm. um, and in one of those segments, they look at Florida. And they look at the FCAT, which is a test that was used in the state of Florida uh, to d determine whether or not students would be allowed to proceed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, nuance here in the, in the debate, right? There's, a, there's a serious concerns, I think, about this idea of social promotion, the idea that students will be advanced for no other reason that they're older, right? But there are some serious consequences for having these types of uh, policies put in place, right? That students, based on a test where yeah. they're in, in, the, in the academic community, I, I I'm not sure that there is a consensus that these standardized tests are the best measure right. of whether or not a student is learning or is capable of, of learning more if they, if they move on, right? But to use a very limited measure to determine whether or not a student is going to be retained or not. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, what we know uh, that happened in Florida is that there were um, thousands upon thousands of young students of color that were retained uh, in the lower grades, that there were mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of students of color that were not allowed to get a high school diploma because they did not simple, they didn't pass this test, even though they had been admitted to colleges, right? I mean, these, these high stakes tests disproportionately affect poor and communities of color. And mm -hmm. so, in, in, unless we want to have a serious conversation about how best to address the needs of those communities, right? Coming up with an, uh, an accountability measure that penalizes them, I think is mm -hmm. uh, short-sighted mm -hmm. and, and too punitive in nature. Wonderful. Next question, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for this uh, great discussion. Thank you for being here. Mm. You can be the president while simultaneously we have uh, police brutality that is so rampant. Wonderful. I'm not going to try to repeat that. I think everyone heard it loud and clear. Wonderfully stated, panelists. Theodore, would you like to try and go first? I think you brought up some really interesting issues. So I had spent some time putting together some information. I wanted to give teachers some resources so then whenever started the school year this year when they talked about Ferguson and Brown and all of those things that, you know, that were going on is that there may be some black males that come into the classroom that might be a little bit depressed and I wanted to get them some resources mm -hmm. that helped them go through this and this is what I found and you know, slightly related, I'll come back to it is that a lot of the same things that we look at of symptoms of depression are the same categories that they use to place children and students in special ed. Mm -hmm. So what does it say when depression and symptoms of depression are things that can be put you, put you in detention and special ed and being pushed out of school? And at the same rate, one in four children experience some form of depression. So to answer your question, to make it, go back to what I said, making it relevant for the black males and other males of color in the classroom about Ferguson and Mike Brown and all the other countless things that have happened to African American men that I want to say unwarrantedly is that if you can humanize the, the males and not use those broad strokes and be able to identify and have them have a safe place where they can articulate their feelings I think that's one a really good idea to kind of like depressurize, but that's a really good way for teachers to be able to connect with their students in the classroom by making it a safe place where you can talk about those things and how they feel and maybe find up some constructive ways to do it. I want culturally responsive pedagogy, but I don't necessarily think the teachers have done their homework. Right? And so what I mean by that, it's not a list of I do this and have a checklist, it's getting to know your students. And with this specific issue, you have different students in different social classes, different economic statuses, different places around the United States. And getting to know your students and how they feel about the issue is a really good way to help that. Wonderful. Dr. Carter Andrews, Dr. Flanau, would you like to weigh in? Well, I would just say there's been some research done um, that talks about, um, you know, how you build this kind of critical race consciousness in, um, you know, students of color, 
uh, males of color as well. I think it's this idea of helping them understand that um, your fate does not have to be Mike Brown's fate, but that there is a reality that there are uh, potential barriers in place that can impede you, right, um, from being uh, the next president of the United States. At the same time, there's a network of systems, right? I believe we have to, they have to hear multiple messages and have multiple archetypes uh, in front of them that say, but you can be this, you can be this. And that has to come from the school, that has to come from the community, that has to come from the home. And so the more in which we can think about how do we, um, again, holistically and collaboratively write positive, help our young men write positive narratives for themselves um, in the face of adversity, right? Um, the, the, better, the better their chances are. So it's developing this level of resiliency within yourself um, that's not fostered solely by you, but that others help you foster. Dr. Flanau? I wouldn't add too much more to that. Okay, thank you. One more question? One more question from the audience. One more question. This has been absolutely outstanding. One more question. No more questions. Going once, going twice, going three times. I would again like to say thank you. Could you join me in giving our panelists a round of applause, please? Talk about open and honest conversations about teaching boys of color. This has been absolutely fantastic, uh, notwithstanding some technical difficulties and glitches. We, we persevered. We came through with that. Uh, you guys have been absolutely phenomenal. And I really, I want to also uh, say to the audience that is here, I know we're off of the live stream and so on and so forth. Again, I can't thank uh, Dr. Uh, Barbara Markle enough in the Office of K-12 Outreach for being able to put this type of, of deep conversation on the forefront of educators throughout the state of Michigan and all the work that, that Dr. Ted Ransaw, Kathleen Snyder, Brian, uh, Ben in the back, there's Ken walking away, he hates accolades, Marcia in the back. This team is just simply outstanding and I hope that through your conversations and your tweets that you reach out to the right people to ensure that this doesn't die on the vine. We really do need to continue to have more embellished conversations about changing the dynamics that are keeping us in this continuum where boys of color are again the stain on the fabric of public education throughout the United States. I think we're better than that. I know we're better than that. And I think unless we lift it and continue it, have it in the forefront of people's minds that are going to make a difference, We'll just continue to repeat this cycle for another generation. We don't want that to happen. Thank you for coming out. And again, thank you, panelists, for being mm -hmm. here today. Wonderful, wonderful job.